Brasil. À l'origine, les cascades étaient effectuées par des acrobates et des artistes de cirque. Ils étaient aussi téméraires qu'ingénieux. La demande du public en matière de poursuites, d'accidents, de sauts, de chutes et d'explosions spectaculaires allant toujours croissant, les cascadeurs sont devenus des professionnels très entraînés. Ce métier exige courage et réflexe. Ces hommes et ces femmes défient constamment l'impossible pour vous en mettre plein les yeux. pounds of pressure. Behind every great movie stunt, there is one man who does it for real. pounds of pressure. Donc c'est là que le camion va me foncer droit dessus. Il devrait faire du 50 à l'heure, et moi du 100. S'il me touche, va savoir où il m'enverra balader. stunt there is one man who does it for real
baseline get ya. Let the baseline get ya. 300 pounds of pressure. Let the baseline get ya. pounds of pressure. I'm gonna go behind the scenes and take a look at Stuntman, 12 months before release. And it all starts here in sunny LA. Welcome to LA and uh, have a nice day and all the other good stuff. Martin Edmondson, the founder of the development company behind Driver and Destruction Derby, and this is our latest game, Stuntman. We've been working on the game now on PlayStation 2 for around a year, just over a year actually, and right at this time now we've got around a year left. Driver was really just a pure driving game, um, really it was based originally on movies, but what we're trying to do with Stuntman is really draw a link between movies and the, and the games by allowing you to play the part of a stuntman who's working on an actual film. The director's asking you to perform a series of stunts, so if he, for example, asks you to drive a car, screech around a corner, smash into some barrels, and then eventually uh, cause the car to uh, barrel roll down the street, then you have to perform exactly that. So he's watching you, and you're, you're scored and rated by him at the end of the stunt. If you don't reach the required level, then you're fired, and if you do, then you can go on to the next city and then start working in the next film. You start off actually working on a low-budget production in London. You know. Being us is what's letting us down. Two small-time gangsters. I told you, I don't like Rogers and I don't like milky tea. Well, I ain't in it for the money. I'm in it to scare people and say cool stuff. Your ultimate aim is to try and work your way up and increase your skills and abilities until you end up working on a high-budget Hollywood blockbuster. Just disappeared off the screen. But you know who they'll send. Special agent? Crown. Simon Crowe. We've got a very diverse range of vehicles in this game, ranging from cars, vans, trucks, armoured cars and jeeps, and they all handle in a very different way. There's even a snowmobile in there in one of the levels which is set in the Swiss Alps. When you're working between films, you can go into an arena, which is like a sports arena, and perform a series of stunts in front of an audience. And the money that you have allows you to get hold of these uh, various things that you can place in there, such as ramps, cars, but also pyrotechnic effects and explosions and so on. And the idea there is just to put on a dramatic stunt show and cause as much destruction in front of the audience as possible. I'm Gareth Edmondson. I'm the uh, project manager on Stuntman for Reflections. At the moment, we're in the main production phase of the project. We've got uh, the full team working full pelt on getting the uh, code complete, the cities built, the levels uh, tidied up, all the cars implemented, the damage looking nice. My main responsibilities are to um, work closely with Gareth and Martin to maintain the quality of the game. I also work closely with UA, developing testing schedules so we can get feedback back to the team on a regular basis and get the product rolling forward continuously. We're really, really proud of how far we've got so far. The E3 demo and all the work that went into that, we're really very, very proud of and it's been received very, very well here. So we're very happy. artist. All of the work that uh, Paul does gets translated into uh, animated cutscenes. We've got six full scenes 
uh, of film trailers. With the mascot boys taking the heat for it, as usual. Yes, look. When you finish driving uh, the car to finish off a stunt, the game's recorded the entire sequence that you've just driven, and uh, that then forms part of a theatrical trailer. Now, the, the standard sort of thing that you'd see on a DVD or at the cinema coming soon from the makers of, and so on and so on. And ultimately, that is your aim, is to create the sections of action that go into those trailers so that we've, we've given you the bits where the, the actors are talking to each other and so on, the backgrounds and, and, and what have you. Um, but the bits of the elements of action that you've just created, the driving, for example, and those bits are automatically spliced in there, and that creates this theatrical trailer. So at the end of the game, you have these six trailers from the different films that have all the footage that you've created, plus the footage that we've created here in the studio. This area is the animation area. This is where all the FMV cutscenes are. Glasses back on your face a bit, that's it. And now just that's that's ideal there. That's all right with Alex. Yeah, cool. Yeah, good for me. Yeah. Thank you very much, everybody. That is a wrap for today. So my name is Vic Armstrong, and I'm the stuntman on PS2. I've worked in over 250 pictures, and I've broken a few bones. I've broken an arm and a leg and a collarbone and a nose. So I was very proud of the Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, where I jumped onto the tank from a moving horse. I had to travel about 18 feet sideways off the top of a horse, onto a moving tank, miss the tracks. That's pretty, pretty tough. James Bond films are also very satisfying and obviously have a great input on, on the Bond, on the action units that I direct nowadays. But this car game, I think, is one of the most interesting stunt games you can get. Basically, 
as my experience as a stuntman over the years, I've tried to give it some as much authenticity as I feel I can. Hopefully some of the experience of 35 years has, has come into the game for you. I hope you enjoyed as much as, as I've enjoyed being involved with it. Hi, hello in Lyon at Atari and Infogram. As you may know, Infogram is the publisher of Alone in the Dark and uh, the famous Driver series. And Reflection is the company who's actually created this wonderful product. So after this first Driver, then Driver 2, now it's time for Stuntman. Definitely Stuntman has a worldwide appeal. I mean, in the US or in Japan or in Europe, everybody has seen these famous movies thinking, oh gosh, if I could do this. Now with Stuntman, it's possible to be one of these unique actors in a great movie. Califragilistic, mommy drop, you go ballistic. You'd think he'd say no. Other guys wouldn't be seen for dust, but we push him right to the edge, and he always comes back for more. At every major production you see him, Monaco, Cairo, Bangkok, always with some chick in town. What do you do with a guy who drives like that? Let, 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 you hire him. Let, let, let the baseline get you. Let, 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 let the baseline get you. Let the baseline get you. Let the baseline get you. Let the baseline. You'd think he'd say no. Other guys wouldn't be seen for dust, but we push him right to the edge. And he always comes back for more. At every major production you see him, Monaco, Cairo, Bangkok, always with some chick in tow. What do you do with a guy who drives like that? You hire him. Let, 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 let the baseline get you. Hi, I'm Vic Armstrong, and this is Stuntman on PlayStation 2. At the moment, I'm standing on the set of the, the latest James Bond film, which is number 20, which doesn't have a name yet. I'm directing the action unit involving the craft you can see behind me. They're putting away for the night. We've just finished busy days filming. I've been involved in stunts for nearly 37 years now. My first one was in 1965. And then I met a stuntman who was looking for good riders for a film called Arabesque. And he chose me because we used to race together. I used to race steeplechase horses. And uh, that's how I got started originally in the business. In the early days, my ambition was to be a stuntman, the best stuntman I could be. Then my ambition was to be a stunt coordinator, who's the guy that organizes the stunts, and that seemed to be more creative than being a stuntman. Then I thought, well, the guy's directing this. Uh, I reckon I could do that better. So then I became a, an action unit director, which is good, because I'm getting too old to keep falling on the ground and breaking bones. I think the highlights of my career were doing the Indiana Jones trilogy, the five or six James Bond films I've done, Superman, when I started in the business, there were probably only about 20, 25 stunt people in England. Now there's probably 350. 
And in England, we have a set of qualifications you have to achieve before you can become a stuntman. The bronze British Standard Award in fencing, boxing, gymnastics, swimming, diving, all that sort of stuff. I've been involved with the Bond film since 1966. My first Bond film was You Only Live Twice, and I was the first ninja down the ropes into the volcano. Then I did On the Magic Secret Service, I was a stunt double for George Lazenby. Then I did Live and Let Die, double Roger Moore. Then I did uh, Never Seen Ever Again, doubling Sean Connery. And then latterly, I've been doing um, Tomorrow Never Dies. The world is not enough, and then this Bond, Bond 20, as action unit director and stunt coordinator. When you're doubling actors, it's quite tough actually, because a lot of actors, people like Harrison Ford, are fantastic athletes in their own right, and they're perfectionists, and they want every inch of the film to be them if they can, because that is their character. And I had an incident, lots of incidents, in fact, with Harrison Ford when I doubled him, because he is such a great athlete. He used to want to do all the stunts himself. And insurance-wise, it's impossible. You can't risk a star because if you can't recognize it as a star, if it could be a double, then it's far safer to use a double because if the star gets hurt, then you've got a $100 million movie that's on the sidelines. So one day on The Last Crusade, Harrison, at least Indiana Jones, had to jump off a rock onto a horse about 15, below, 15 feet below him. And Harrison was insistent that he did this stunt himself, which he probably was capable of. And I was insistent he couldn't, because if he'd broken a leg or you know, put his knee through his teeth when he landed, or anything could happen. And in the end, I had to say to him, look, Harrison, come over here. And I took him behind a rock, and I said, look, Harrison, you're costing me a fortune. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, well, every time a stuntman like myself does a jump like this, we get paid extra money for it. And you're costing me a fortune. And he was so wonderful. He said, oh, my God, what a fool, what a fool, what a fool. I am. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Kick me in the ass whenever I say something silly like that again. Superman, we did some pretty scary stuff, diving from the roof of the stage through the floor of the stage into boxes, and the cameras are upside down, so it looks as though you actually fly out through the roof. I was actually flying out of the roof of Grand Central Station. I was very proud of the Indiana Jones of the Last Crusade. I jumped onto the tank for a moving horse. I did a 100-foot fall on the final conflict. On the last bomb that I did, The World Is Not Enough, we had a, a great boat chase down uh, the River Thames. We choreographed a chase from MI6 to the Dome, and Sunseeker gave us a couple of nice Sunseekers, and uh, one we weren't allowed to damage, but one we could thrash around. We actually tore the, one of the props off that when uh, Bond outmaneuvers the driver of the Sunseeker, and she crashes through a pier. And, uh, but that was the only real damage we did to it. While working on the Bonds, we, we've done obviously quite a lot of car work. We did a great chase on Tomorrow Never Dies in the, in the car park, where we, had, we actually had 16 7 Series BMWs, which were given to us, thank goodness, by BMW. They were supposed to be blind uh, driven, so therefore you're not supposed to be able to see the driver. And uh, Piers Brosnan is operating on his handheld phone, little gizmo. So we had to have these cars completely gutted and all the seats taken out so the stuntman could lay flat on the floor and we had lipstick cameras put in the wing mirrors and in the rear view mirrors so he could see where he's going through a sort of three, as best three dimensional pictures we could give him from these three positions of the cameras. And he was laying flat on his back on the floor of the car just looking at three television screens. The worst thing he found was motion sickness being totally, he's incredible, he's right, racing the parry back and everything the guy was doing the driving. And he, he was getting motion sickness because he was laying in the dark with a moving car looking at these three television screens. At the end of that, I think we wrecked 10 of them and uh, sent six back. So it's quite an expensive sequence. And on Bond 20, we have a car chase in it, the compulsory car chase. We've got uh, a Vanquish driven by Bond, an Aston Martin Vanquish. He's gone back to Aston Martin. Chased by the bad guy in a Jaguar XKR. And I'm going to do the chase on ice. So we've had all the cars modified. We've got four of each in case we crash them, which I hope we do, because it's what's supposed to happen in the movie. And um, we're having a modified for four-wheel drive, uh, which so they'll be the only four-wheel drive Aston Martin vanquishes in the world. I think it's cost us a million and a quarter to, to modify them. I did Charlie's Angels, and we did a Formula One race. And 
we had to build the cars for it because filming is stopping and starting and, and uh, everything like that. So we had to have our own cars built with automatic gearboxes. You have to have a, a special type of insert car or camera car that carries the cameras to photograph them. And we used the car that they used on Days of Thunder which I think could go up to 160, 170 miles an hour. And I was going around the California Speedway doing the shots that I needed, and I'm just laying on the floor of the insert car, looking at the monitors, talking through a radio to the two drivers, and we're on the bank track, and I was saying, you know, you go high and you go low, just trying to get them crossing behind camera. And I said, can't we go any faster? What are we doing? And somebody looked around and said, we're doing 130. We also did a really nice Bronco jump, which is not that spectacular, but the technicalities are things that intrigue me. To preserve the car, we jump into boxes, cardboard boxes on plastic, so that when it lands in the boxes, the plastic slides. Because there's an old saying in the stunt business, it's not falling that hurts, it's the stopping. If you see the movie, the car actually flies through beautifully horizontally with him sitting up there as bold as brass, and it just drops out of frame, and in fact, it lands and in our boxes and we pulled it out of the boxes and drove it home that night. Continuity in general in movies is always quite interesting, especially stunt movies, because uh, I was doing a picture in North Carolina once called Black Dog, a Patrick Swayze movie, where we had a sequence with a truck swerving around a bus and flying through a car park and smashing cars in the car park. The truck ran through the car park, smashed the car to smithereens, a couple of cameras didn't work, or somebody was looking the wrong way, or somebody was looking at camera, a couple of technical hitches, so we did it again. Subsequently, we ended up doing this whole shot about six times, but of course, we only had the one set of cars. Well, the first time's okay, because the cars are whatever colour they happen to be in foreground that the, the truck smashes through, so if one side's beaten up, you can turn the cars around. So we turned the cars around, smashed the other the side, uh, there was still a problem, so we turned them around, put them head on, smashed into them head on. By the end of the four takes, the, every corner of the cars were broken, so we started bringing other cars in, but the problem was the other cars were different colours. So you have a sequence with all the different cuts and angles of this truck smashing through a car park, hitting a car from one side, and as it comes out the other side of hitting the car, the cars change position and change colour. Another interesting continuity blip is in Diamonds Are Forever, James Bond, when he's in Vegas. James Bond is escaping in the Mustang and he goes into an alleyway which looks like a dead end, chased by the police and they think they've got him cornered. When he flips it up and skis it through there, drives through on two wheels. And then you have the reverse shot where he exits the alleyway on two wheels, but the, the catch is that hardly anybody ever noticed it. He comes out with the other on the other two wheels, i.e. the other side down. So he goes on his left wheels and comes out with his right wheels down in an alleyway that's about six foot wide, which is obviously impossible to do, which is, uh, shows you how movies are shot in different places at different times, but it's, it's one of the faux pas they left in and has become movie history now. I have achieved some awards over the years, and the two I'm most proud of was last year I got a Academy Award for the Fan Descender invention, and this year I've got a BAFTA, which is the English Oscar, which I achieved for a Lifetime Achievement Award, so I'm very proud of that. I've worked on about 250 movies, and I've broken a certain amount of bones, but uh, even Michael Schumacher will have a crash in a car, and he's one of the best in the world, so it's, it goes with the trade, unfortunately. I've broken arm, and leg, and ribs, and nose, shoulder, things like that. It's a, a very nomadic life, you work in Hong Kong one time and get great friends there, and the next time you're in North America, or you could be in China. Yeah, you tend to make friends very easily, but uh, we tend to not see them again for probably years. It's literally one phone call away from your whole life being changed. You know, the great thing about the business, although you can get out of, be out of work for periods of time, it's just one phone call and you can suddenly be halfway around the world, I hope and I'm sure. My input, I think, is just to make sure that it is, that the stuntman game is authentic, similar to the, my job on the Bond. I have to take it as far as we can, but at the same time keep it within the realms of reality. This is Vic Armstrong saying goodbye. I hope my 35 years of experience has contributed to the stuntman game and you enjoy playing it as much as I've enjoyed being involved with it.
name is Tommy McTagg, and I crash cars for a living. I started out by doing smaller crashes. I worked my way up to the bigger one. Tommy Trouble McTague was born and raised in Del Mar, New York, and he'd always dreamed of becoming a stuntman. When I was five years old, I decided I wanted to be a stuntman. I watched a famous daredevil on TV and pointed at him crashing motorcycles, and right away I said, that's what I'm going to do for a living. Right after watching the daredevil on TV, I went outside, built my own homemade ramps out of tires and plywood. I got an old hand-me-down bike from my brother with a banana seat and sissy bar. I used to break that bike quite a bit. I started out doing safety work for other stunt guys. I'd build their ramps, get their cars ready by stripping them out, putting the roll cage in. I'd belt them in, detonate their bombs, and make sure they got out of the car safely. The stunt guys I did the safety work for really liked the way I worked, so they eventually gave me a chance to do my own stunts. In 1997, Tommy started Trouble Stunts, and Trouble came to life. His traveling stunt show crisscrossed the country, performing death-defying stunts at raceways and drag strips across the USA. Of course, a lot more goes into his stunts than just getting into his car and launching himself into the air. There are so many details to worry about. Most importantly is to make sure the car can get up to the desired speed and that it meets a checklist of safety requirements. On the day of the jump, I had my seat pads and belts and then double and triple check everything one more time. My safety crew also helps check everything I do. These people are very important to me. There are a lot of things that can go wrong, but only one thing that can go right, that I crash the car and walk away. like the word daredevil. The definition is one who is recklessly bold. What I do is well thought out and calculated. The definition of a stunt is a sensational or remarkable feat. I guess I'm a combination of a daredevil and a stuntman. People always ask me if I get scared. I get scared, but usually it's a week or a couple days before the jump. But on the day of the jump, I'm completely focused. I concentrate on the jump and I mentally prepare myself for it.